Most of us know about the famous gambling match in Mahabharat where Yudhishthir lost everything. Now the question comes whether this was a one of reference or the practice of gambling was common in ancient India. In this video, we will try to answer this question and we will also see how the ancients thought about this practice. Now, if we start our story from the Indus Valley Civilization, we find that from the city of Mohanjodoro, archaeologists have found the earliest evidence of dice playing in the Indian subcontinent. These dice of Mohanjodoro may seem similar to our modern die. But there is a big difference. In a modern die, the sum of two opposite sides is 7. But this is not the case in these IVC dice. Archaeologists also argue that these dice of IVC were thrown on a smooth surface. They were not thrown on the ground. We can say this because of the sharp edges of these dice. If they were thrown on ground, we would have seen rougher edges. Although we can safely say that the game of dice was common in Indus Valley civilization, but to associate it with gambling would be a speculation. The reason being that we do not have any written record about the Indus Valley civilization. So we cannot say how this game was played or whether there was any gambling or betting involved. This need of speculation completely disappears when we move to the Vedic period, thanks to the Vedic literature. In the book 10th of the Rig Veda, there is a whole passage in which a gambler laments about losing everything because of this practice of gambling. One of the verses of this passage goes like this. The gambler's wife is left forlorn and wretched. The mother moans the son who wanders homeless. In constant fear, in debt and seeking riches, he goes by night onto the home of others. Now, I have included only these two lines because the whole passage is too long for me to recite. But you get the point that during this period, for some, this practice of or this game of gambling has become an addiction and there were serious consequences of this addiction. Now, contrary to the popular belief, during the Vedic period, this type of die or even this type of die was not used. Instead, we find that in the Vedic literature, there is a reference which suggests that in the place of a die, the nut of the Vibhitika tree was used. Vibhitika tree is called Terminalia bellerica. And in the Vedic literature, there were other names of this tree. Vibhitika is one of them. Then there is Aksh which was used for this tree. Now what is interesting is that the game of dice or gambling itself was called Vibhitika or Aksh. Now scholars are not sure how the different games of dice were played during this time. But there are some scholars who believe that the least complex game went like this. Suppose you are a player and first you have to choose odd or even. So suppose you have chosen odd. Now after choosing odd, you have to throw bunch of Vibhitika nuts on the ground and on the ground there is a circle that has been drawn. So after your throw, another player will count how many Vibhitika nuts landed within the circle. And if the number is odd, then you have won. And if the number is even, then you have lost. So this was the simplest game which some scholars believe was played during the Vedic times. In Shatpata Brahmana, which is another Vedic literature, we hear of someone called Akshavap. Akshavap is most likely, according to scholars, the superintendent of gambling during this time. In Tetriya Samhita, he is described as one of the Ratnins of the Vedic Raja. Ratnins basically translates as jewel. So this Ratni was most likely the companion or advisor of the Vedic king. So the fact that this superintendent of gambling was a Ratnin of the Vedic Raja suggests that during the Vedic times, this 
gambling practice was associated with the royalty as well. In the post-Vedic period, we find that the terminologies have evolved. In the Vedic period, we have seen that for gambling, terms like Vibhitika or Aksh was used. But now we have the, the most common term which we have is Dyut. And the term Dyut not only meant gambling, but it also meant the dye itself. Another term that has been used for the dye is Pasha. So from this term, we have the Hindi term Pase. Now the term Dyut also appears in Kautilya's Arthashastra. And Kautilya has dedicated a whole chapter on this topic. The title of this chapter is Dyut Samahavyam. Dyut Samahavyam, this term, if you translate it, it would be gambling and betting. Dyut is for gambling and Samahavyam is for betting. Now, the difference between gambling and betting has not been explained clearly in Kautilya's Arthashastra, but Manu provides us a clear definition in his Manu Smriti. He explains that gambling or Dyut involve inanimate objects like die, whereas uh, batting or samahavyam involve living creatures. Now, the most common batting games in ancient India was cockfighting. And we all know that this batting game was not popular only in ancient times. Even in modern times, we have references which suggest that cockfighting as a batting game was popular in the Indian subcontinent. Now, coming back to Arthashastra, Kautilya never approves of gambling but allows it. He also does not have a high regard for gamblers and thinks that gamblers are generally fraudulent players. For Cotillier, gambling should be a state-run industry. And he advises the king that there should be a special official called Dyut Adhyaksh that would be assigned to regulate this practice and gambling should be done at a special location that was run by the state. If someone was found gambling in other locations, he should be fined. These state-run gambling centers were truly state-run because Kautilya advises that the Dyut Adhyaksh should provide the leather strap on which the game of the dice was was played and the die itself so from the leather strap to the die everything was provided by the state to these gamblers and in return for providing these facilities the state or the dyut adhyaksh got 5% of the winning sum so suppose you have won 100 panas from one of these state-run gambling centers. Now, when you are going to your home, you have to give five panas to the Dyutadhyaksh. For Kautilya, the need to restrict gambling to state-run centers arised because of two important factors, wealth and security. Security because, let's say, there are multiple centers where gambling is taking place and these centers are not controlled by the state. They are private centers. So in no time, these private gambling centers can become center of crime as well. So there was a security aspect towards this Cotillia's advice. Secondly, by allowing gambling only to take place in governmental centers meant that now government had some tax as well. As we have seen from the winning sum, the state took 5%. So there was an additional benefit in restricting gambling to only state-run centers. Speaking of dye, Cotillia mentions that dyes were made up of ivory. This dye, which you are seeing right now, is also made up of ivory and is 2000 to 1700 years old. This dye was found from Western Punjab. So from this, it is quite clear that one of the most popular materials from which dyes were made was ivory. Now, the dyes of Indus Valley civilization were not made up of ivory. They were made up, most of these were made up of terracotta. Now, coming back to early India, if you look at Dharma Shastras and Dharma Sutras, we find that when it comes to the practice of gambling, there is no clear consensus. Now, these texts never celebrates it. But when it comes to prohibition, there are different perceptions. 
So, for example, if you look at Manu Smriti, Manu is quite strict on gambling. He advises the king that the king should not allow betting or gambling within his realm. He recommends that a king should give corporal punishment or banish gamblers or bettors. Now, if you look at Apastam Dharma Sutra, here gambling is allowed, but only for kings. And in Apastam Sutra, it is mentioned that gambling should take place within the assembly hall and only those who are upright and honest should gamble. Narada Smriti and Brihaspati Smriti allow gambling, provided that a share should be given to the king. So in this way, we can say that Manu goes against Kautilya's view, whereas Narad Smriti and Brihaspati Smriti share the same view as that of Kautilya. Till now, whatever we have discussed comes only from literary sources. But when it comes to gambling, we find that there are plenty of inscriptional sources as well, which is quite strange because when it comes to other important topics of ancient India, we find that there are not much evidence. But this is not the case with gambling. So if, you if we talk about uh, inscriptional evidence, we find that from Rajasthan, there is an inscription that is dated to 689 AD. And this inscription talks about gambling parties that were attended by the kings. And here, the term Dyut Adhyaksh has not been used for the superintendents of gambling. Uh, the term which is used in this inscription is Dyut Sabhapati. In fact, there are inscriptions that talk about taxes that was levied on gambling. So, from the 6th century, we have a Pallava grant of King Simmavarvan that talks about a tax that was levied on gambling. Then there is the Bilhari inscription of Kalachuri Yuvraj II of Tripuri that talks about the same thing. So, from the literary as well as inscriptional sources, we can say that the practice of gambling was common in ancient India. But its perception varied. On the one hand, we have Manu who completely opposes it and on the other hand we have Kautilya who allows it provided that it should be state run. Interestingly, the modern Indian state, when it comes to gambling, it is closer to Manu's view rather than being close to Kautilya's view. Now, if you like this video, do watch these videos as well, where I talk about other aspects of ancient India. If you like this video, do subscribe. Thank you for watching.